Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's begin, in, and today is, is something different for you, and I'm pleased to be here. My name is Joe Seneca, and Ken has asked me to, to pinch hit for him today, okay, with the baseball metaphor. Ken's off doing good work somewhere else, doing his scholarship, and you're here with me today and I with you to talk about something really different. You've been talking about the New Jersey Shore, and now we're adding the economics thereof, okay? So we have to see what that means and how we're going to attack it, and I will try to do so succinctly and in, ex and in an accessible way, uh, and I welcome your questions and interactions because this is something different, uh, really different from what's come before in this, in this class for you and uh, take it on its own terms, try to understand what we're trying to do, and within that, see if it makes sense. And what it is, it's an economist's look at the Jersey Shore and the interface of the issues that you've been addressing from the physical sciences as they interact with money, with the economics thereof. That's what we're going to do. And let's be on our way. I welcome your interaction with me as we go along. Don't hesitate. I've taught these types of classes for, for a good period of time. I'm teaching another signature course like this on the economics of climate change, climate change and energy, where I give the economics lectures, about three or four of them. And that is an interdisciplinary course like this is. And there's a biologist and that, and a chemist, and an engineer, and a physicist, and then I'm the token social scientist, okay? I come in for the, for the social science. So that's what we're about to do. So, so let's, let's get underway, and again, thanks for, for coming out for, the, for this special, the special class, and I hope to make it interesting for you, and, uh, and a different approach, and perhaps it will you know, spur some interest in you either doing more economics or more of the interface of economics and these science issues. So good. So it's a treat to be here with you. Ken's course on sea level and the New Jersey Shore. And I've looked at your syllabus and some of the previous classes, the lectures. And by the way, this PowerPoint is on the Sakai site, so you don't have to you know, take notes from it, just from the discussion of it. And you can access the, the slides from, from the Sakai site. And at the end of the PowerPoint and on the Sakai site are a series of references with the links to them that uh, are the background material for, for this class. So you could, if you wish, look at those references as well. There's three slides of references that are on the site with the, the URL, URL links. With your choice of, of you know, taking on this course, it's not a... It's not a simple course, it's a complex topic, it's complex science, and I'm impressed with the depth and the sophistication of the science that you've, you've studied thus far, and especially your work to, in, to understand the complexities of Earth history processes as they affect sea level, climate, and the land-sea interface, the Jersey Shore. And so today, Ken has asked me to do something different in this ambitious and timely course, namely to examine some of the economic issues that accompany the natural science you are studying and to discuss how economists approach the effects of these earth science processes on economic activity. So let's try to do three things, three straightforward things. First, and this is very straightforward, take a brief overview of the economy of coastal New Jersey its economic, demographic, and income profile. Second, and really the core of today's class, let's examine the economics of the services and goods, services and goods, the things that you know in the economy, the computer, the car, the lawyer services, the engineering services, the services and goods that are produced. But here we're going to examine the services and goods by the natural capital, what we're going to call the natural capital of the New Jersey Shore. This is the key and novel concept for our discussion, new, dis new concept. 
That is to understand what economists call natural capital, natural capital assets, as distinct from human-made capital, the latter, human-made capital, being the equipment. structure of highways, railroads, airports, such or physical capital we are all really familiar with generates annual economic values, annual economic outputs, goods and services. These have a monetary value. We can express those values in dollars. And they are the annual economic return or the annual economic value of the goods and services of those physical, human, man-made capital assets that, they, that helps produce them. And also from the employment, the income, and the tax revenues that flow from that production. And that's familiar to us in an economic sense as we view the economy. But economists, over the last several decades, have conceptualized and analyzed the economic implications of what we've called natural capital, a symmetric concept to physical or human-made capital, namely that there is an annual flow of economic value generated by natural capital assets generated by forests, wetlands, beaches, oceans, lakes, rivers, estuaries, tidal areas, and natural ecological systems. Thus, the word asset is used for natural capital symmetrically to its more familiar application to human-made or physical capital. That is, these natural assets, assets which you have been studying in terms of the science thereof, they too, these natural capital assets, have economic value, measurable in dollars, and they generate, as does physical capital, an annual flow of goods and services that we can express, if we are clever enough, in monetary terms. We will explore that concept and its implications for the New Jersey Shore. And that's the, the novel part of today. And finally, that's our second task. Our third and concluding task is to briefly link the performance of the overall economy of the shore to the need to maintain the environmental integrity of these natural assets. That is to prevent the deterioration of natural capital from, for example, climate change, which you have been studying. And if that occurs, if those natural capital assets deteriorate, or in the economist's words, depreciate, there would be resulting economic costs or damages that would ensue from the loss, the foregoing, the reduction in the annual flow of value of goods and services that those natural capital assets now provide. That's the concept, and you have to think about that and try to think in those terms to see what we are going to do. So let's begin briefly, very easy way, uh, to start with a brief profile of the four counties, the four New Jersey counties, going from north to south that make up the coastal region of the state, our state. Monmouth County, Ocean County, Atlantic County, and Cape May County. There are an estimated 127 miles of shoreline from Sandy Hook at the top to Cape May at the bottom, an estimated 7,837 acres of beach, not so many acres when you think about all the people that try to get on those acres in the summer, 456,000 acres of estuary and tidal bay, 300,000 acres of coastal shelf, the area right off the beach, and 191,000 acres of saltwater wetlands. And there's the source on the slide, and it's on the Sakai site for those numbers. These four counties represent approximately 15% of the total employment in the state. If you add up all the jobs in the state and the jobs in these four counties, 
They have 15% of total employment in 2009, and they represent about, and in those counties live about 18% of the population in New Jersey. Many, some of your families may live in those four counties. Uh, those counties representing almost 20%, 18% of the state's population, one in five, a little bit less of all New Jerseyans live in those four counties. The population of the shore counties, this is the, from the, the census, the 2010 census that your, your households all just recently completed. The population of those shore counties has been growing significantly faster. You see all four counties growing at about 6.6% over the last decade from the two censuses, 2000 to 2010, uh, growing at 6.6%. And that's significantly faster by about a third from the rest of the state, who's, where the population, that's the bottom row, has only grown about 4%. Notice the strong growth, particularly in Ocean County, 12.8%, significantly, three times higher than the state as a whole. Uh, only Cape May County did not participate in this growth with a loss, surprising loss, of 4.9% of its permanent resident population. Permanent resident population. Go down there on a July weekend, it's a different story, but of the permanent re resident population. Northern counties, Mammoth and Ocean, are linked to the North Jersey and New York labor markets with commuter rail connections especially true in Monmouth County. And as a result, they're distinct in terms of the business sector profile of their employment base. And let's look at that, the employment base. The first column is the total employment in thousands in each of the counties. And the second two columns are the, number of em the, the share of employment in two particular sectors, the leisure and hospitality industry, and then in something called professional and business services. Leisure and hospitality industries, as you would expect, casino gambling, hotels, recreation, lodging, food, restaurants. Professional and business services is the whole range of services, legal services, accounting services, computer services, uh, and all the other services associated with businesses. So the two northern counties, particularly Monmouth County, look at that, are distinct in terms of their profile. They have larger shares of em total employment in professional and business services. Notice 12.9% in Monmouth and in, uh, in, in uh, Ocean, 7.1% compared to much lower percentages of those two shares in Atlantic and Cape May. In contrast, Atlantic and Cape May, they do not have large labor markets nearby. Closest lab big labor market is Philadelphia, and that's 60 miles or more away. Uh, nor do they have the extensive high-speed rail connections. Instead, as you would expect, and as we know sort of anecdotally, leisure and, the leisure and hospitality industry, hotels, food, entertainment, associated with the New Jersey Shore activities and casino gambling in Atlantic City are much more prominent components of the labor market profile in those counties. Notice those shares, 37 percent almost in Atlantic County in leisure and hospitality, and over a quarter of all jobs in Cape County are associated is associated with the leisure and hospitality industry. Notice the statewide average of only 8.8% of leisure and hospitality in those industries. The age distribution of the population in those counties is also of note with the growth of retirement communities, particularly in Ocean and Cape May counties. And that results in a disproportionate share of residents 65 years and older about one in five, notice about 20% 20, 20 in Ocean County, 13% in, uh, in, in, uh, in Monmouth, in Atlantic, and then a high 20% again in, in, uh, in Cape May. Uh, a disproportionate sh portion share, one in uh, 20 about 20%, one in every, every five residents in those two counties is senior citizen, and New Jersey as a whole, only 13.4% of all residents are senior citizens. As a result of the differing employment and age profiles in the four counties, there's significant, significant variation in income in the economic measure of, of, of power, income. Uh, notice Monmouth County has a median income. The median is the number that's in the middle. If there are 100 of us in the room, let's rank all our incomes from the lowest income to the highest income 
the median income is the income of the person that's in the 50th position, okay? That's the statistical median. That's the definition of a median uh, in, in statistics. So the median household income in Monmouth County, over $80,000, $80,500. And note how that compares with the statewide average of just over $68,000. So that's higher than the statewide average. Well, Atlanta County's median is uh, more than a quarter, 26% below the statewide average. So you have a great variation in income, basically going north to south there. The tourism industry of our state and the tourism industry of the shore, and as we've all experienced it as beachgoers and, and, and visitors, is a very large economic engine for New Jersey and for these counties. And it generates very large increases in the summer in population, in recreation visits there, and in the economic activity associated with that tourism. Jersey Shore tourism is estimated to generate over $30 billion, $30 billion annually in economic activity with, now let's link it, with the shores, beaches, and water quality of the ocean, the critical, perhaps the most critical element that is attracting those vacationers and visitors that throng to the Jersey coast May through September. Then there is the casino industry, recently beset by the effects of recession, deep recession in the state and in the country in 2007 through 2009, and new competition in Pennsylvania and New York as those states have opened casino gambling in their, in their boundaries. Nevertheless, a recent study done in, by Rutgers, my colleagues in fact at the Blaustein School, of the casino industry indicates that it generates, it's responsible for, in New Jersey, about 100,000 jobs directly, that is the employees in the casino industry, and then indirectly from all the spending that goes on from the income earned by those employees who spend that income and generate further jobs, what economists call the multiplier effect. That job total, 100,000, is more than the state's pharmaceutical industry, which is a huge industry in New Jersey, to give you again perspective. Again, a key part of the attraction of the casino industry, why did it grow, why was it put in Atlantic City, not somewhere else in the state, is the direct proximity of the Atlantic City to the area's clean beaches and clean water, clean ocean. The state's housing market in these counties has not yet started to recover significantly, at least, from the harsh negative effects of the Great Recession. Housing was the epicenter of this last recession. It all began with a collapse in the housing sector nationally, and that played out in New Jersey as well. This slide gives you the median sales price. We know what the median is, the sales price of single family existing homes in the four counties in the United States and in the nation from the peak of the housing bubble, fourth quarter 2005, to the most recently available data, the fourth quarter 2010. You have the median home values and you have in the last column the percentage change. Notice those percentage changes, they're all negative. Home prices, values going down. So. This recession, this housing recession, follows the sharp collapse, or reflects the sharp collapse in home sales, and an approximate, in this slide, 4 to 16 percent decline in the, shore, in, the, in the house values in those shore counties between the end of the boom, 2005 fourth quarter, and now. However, note, the decline, except for Atlantic County, in the, in the shore counties is less than the statewide decline. Statewide, on average, not every house, but on average, these are house sales, prices went down about 16% over this time. That's a loss, that's a significant loss. You know, if your parents are trying to borrow against that house value or they have a mortgage uh, and the house value is going down, that's how people get into trouble. 
houses are called, and maybe it's the right metaphor this course, this for this class, being underwater. You hear that expression. What does that mean? They're underwater. Not literally underwater, although it could happen with sea level rise, particularly in the shore counties, but underwater in sense the value of the house drops below the mortgage. And that's a problem. So what should the asset that you own on which you have debt, the debt is more than the value of the asset. And that's called being underwater. This 16% decline on average is a significant decline over the four years, particularly when house prices were rising at double digits before that. Everybody thought they were on the gravy train, buy a house and get rich. Look at the, however, look at New Jersey compared to the U.S. number. U.S., nationally, house prices are down even more, 20, almost 25%, and still falling, still falling. Okay. Conditions in the individual municipalities in the shore counties vary widely from these numbers. All real estate is local. So if you, were, you would have to go to the individual municipalities and see how they play out. But in general, uh, the largest price declines have occurred in the high end of the shore home market. So that's all, that's, number, that's task number one, a profile of the county. So there's no analytical economics there. It's simply descriptive statistics to give you a picture of what's happening in the economics of the science that you are studying along the shore uh, land interface. But the housing market is a good lead in to the key economic concept, to the key concept of natural capital. Now, how am I going to get the natural capital from this? Well, let's look at it. The economic and demographic development pressures over time at the New Jersey shore. Go back in your own lifetime as a young child and what was the shore like then and what is it like now in terms of population densities and development. And then go back into my sons at your young age and then at my age when I was that age and you would see an area of New Jersey that has changed from completely rural underdeveloped area to the wall-to-wall -to -wall tourism industry that we have, Sandy Hook to Cape May, with a few exceptions because it's state-owned property in between, Island Beach, Sandy Hook. Otherwise, solid development. Now, so let's look at that conceptually. The natural capital of the Jersey Shore, high-quality ocean, beaches, tidal marshes, estuary, attracts the arrow goes up there from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, attracts the economic development that has occurred at the shore. Why did those counties, why did those areas grow along the shore? It's nice to live there. It's attractive from the physical environment perspective. People like to live near the ocean. It has enormous quality of life ramifications and benefits. But the development that occurs there all the development, more housing, more roads, more infrastructure, more commercial space, that's at the 12 o'clock part of the diagram, has placed everlasting environmental pressures and created natural damages, ecological effects, and threatened the natural integrity of the coastal region. Uh, but that, those natural, that natural integrity is the very attribute that attracted the development in the Jersey Shore. That is the natural capital assets of the beaches, the ocean, the tidal bays, the estuaries, the marshes, the open space, the natural life systems are in turn threatened qualitatively and quantitatively by the degradation, again the economists would use the word the depreciation, of the air, water, and land that accompanies that development. Thus, the response, the policy response, something that economists are interested in, the planners are interested in, the response of the state and federal government has been to institute a series of environmental and land use policies that attempt to control and regulate the negative spillovers, that 12 o'clock loop, that arrow, the negative spillover effects from the development and prevent or at least mitigate the deterioration of the very assets that attracted the development in the first place. The ultimate, the ultimate, extreme, the ultimate manifestation of such deterioration, those natural damages, that loop, of course, would be 
a large sea level rise due to the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that would fundamentally alter and severely damage the existing natural capital interface of ocean, beach, bay, marsh, and estuary. Right? If that happened, the New Jersey shore as we know it, and Ken has been talking to you about the possible meters there, right? Beachfront property might become New Brunswick. That would be bad news for the shore if that happened, right? But it won't take much because if you go down there and you stand on the tallest building in, in, you know, in Atlantic City, you're 100 feet above sea level. What is the level of sea level that would have to rise to, to really affect that whole, all the barrier islands? And, and that's what you've been studying from the physical side. That would have profound economic implications. So that's the ultimate deterioration, the type of damage that you would be studying, sea level rise. It is a highly difficult and highly complex task to, to design and implement a uh, effective public policies to maintain the environmental integrity of this natural capital and especially to prevent and mitigate global climate change. And that would be the subject for a whole different lecture or lectures course on climate change and the policies on how to control it. And that's the other signature course that I teach. What policies do we use to prevent the type of damages from occurring that you are studying associated with the accumulation of CO2, the carbon forcing in the, in the natural environment? That policy task matches in complexity from a social science perspective the, uh, that of understanding scientifically from the science perspective the highly complex and interdependent earth and marine and atmospheric systems of those same natural assets that you are now studying. So let's move within this core second mission of our task today to the economics. Here is the economics. All oh, that's the run-up, the run-up to the main gig, okay? So clear the cobwebs, and, and here, it gets, here it gets even conceptually a little bit more complex. But uh, here's the intuition. The natural capital assets broadly defined as we have described it now, in our case, the Jersey beaches, the ocean, the bays, the estuaries, the wetlands, and the land-sea interface, provide an annual flow of benefits to individuals, to the economy of the state and to the broader society, collectively as a society. These benefits take two forms, two forms. Notice what the slide says, the economic flow from natural capital. Examples, they take the form of goods. Remember the equivalent in the, in the regular economy, the computer, my shirt, the tie, my car your house, those are the economic goods and services that the economy produces with physical capital and labor. The natural capital of the shore produces goods, for example, commercially harvested fish and shellfish, uh, minerals, plants, uh, those would be goods, and it produces services, such as the multiple forms of outdoor recreation, that is, beach going, recreational fishing, boating, bird watching, Nutrient recycling, water filtration, buffering from floods and storm surges, aesthetic amenities, it's nice there, it's just nice, and the maintenance of biodiversity of natural e ecological systems, the maintenance of the, diverse, the bio biological diversity of the life forms in the natural systems, in the ocean, the estuaries, the marshes, the tidal bays. Most of those benefits, these service benefits, are what economists call use benefits. They are benefits from people that use it. That is, the natural capital generates an annual flow of valuable goods and services. But just think conceptually, the benefits could also be non-use. Those are, they make sense, those benefits that come out of there. But there are other benefits that aren't even associated with using those natural assets. We use up, we harvest fish, we catch fish, we go to the beach, 
We are using the services that the beach and the natural systems provide. But there are non-use benefits. For example, that biodiversity benefit. Just protecting the biodiversity. We don't use the biodiversity, but we might in the future. Uh, existence value. I value, as a society collectively, we value the existence of the natural habitats that are there. And bequest value. I want to transfer to my children as you may wish to transfer to your children later this century. Not much later this century, but later this century. Uh, a natural environment that is undiminished from what you inherited from your generation, your parents' generation. In other words, a bequest value. We want to, as a society, leave the next generation with natural capital that's undamaged from what we received. It. That is a, an estate value. We want to pass on collectively as a society. Now, this flow of goods and services accrues. Who gets it? Individuals, businesses get it, the broader economy gets it, and society in general gets it. And this flow occurs annually. It is an annual flow. In, economic ter in economics terms, it's a financial return. That is, it has a monetary value that occurs annually as a return on the state's natural capital assets. These benefits that I've listed can be measured in dollars. Again, if we're clever. And the goal of such measurements, trying to measure those in dollars, is symmetric in principle to the goal of measuring the economic returns of conventional financial assets or physical capital or human capital. A conventional question asked in finance is, what is the annual dollar flow generated by any specific financial asset. I own a bond. What's the annual return I get on it? I own a, an apartment building. What's the annual return I get on it? That's a typical financial question. And the answer to that question is very important. So this conventional financial question, what is the annual flow generated by any specific asset, is an important question. Because when I answer that question, that generates highly useful economic information. For example, I can compare returns across assets. Where do I allocate my scarce, finite capital? How do I choose which asset to use to invest it? The answer to that question can inform, an economist would say, should determine the efficient choice the efficient investment choice. This is finance, the efficient investment choice. That is, in which asset to invest, either as an individual or, for our later purposes, as a society, where to invest our limited and finite resources. I can't invest in everything. Where should I invest? I need to know the return on the asset to make an efficient choice. Obviously, invest where the return, the expected return, is highest. Also, second important question it can add, answer is it allows the asset to be valued. It allows what finance people and finance scholars and economists say, the asset to be capitalized. What is the value of the asset? Now, let's do an example, a very simple example. Again, the numbers are on the Sakai site. Just follow the logic. Suppose you owned a financial asset, for example, a bond, a U.S. Treasury bond, that provided an annual return of $5,000 a year in perpetuity, every year, forever. That would be called a, a bond that had no maturity, and that's essentially what we do. You could buy a U.S. Treasury bond today. You can leave the room. In fact, you don't have to leave the room. Call up your broker if you have a broker and tell them you want to buy a 30-year Treasury bond, and you can buy it. And in 30 years, if you hold it, it'll mature, and you can buy another one. Okay? And then you can buy another one, or your children can buy. 
the U.S. government is constantly financing and refinancing its debt. So it's as if the bond is forever. And you know it pays, because it says it on it, $5,000 a year to the bearer. Who's going to pay you? The United States government is going to pay you every year. You're going to get a payment through a check from the U.S. Treasury. You own the bond. You're the bondholder of record. You get $5,000 a year. The question is, what's the value of the bond? If the interest rate on assets of similar risk, and this would be low risk assets because it's the United States government that is responsible for the interest payment, suppose that number was 5%, that the interest rate on assets of similar risk was 5%, then that implies, and this is the, uh, this is the valuation, the capitalization, the present value of that bond, that your asset, is $100,000. How do you get it? How do you get that number? Well, that number is obtained by dividing the annual return, the $5,000, by the 5%. That is, someone who is, would be willing to pay $100,000 for the promise, the bond, the promise to pay $5,000 a year to the owner of the bond every year forever. If the interest rate changes, the price changes. And that's what goes on every day in the bond market. Okay, now, where are we? The key to determining the answer to that last question, the capitalization of the asset, the value of the asset, is to know the $5,000 number. I gave you that to begin with, the $5,000 return, and that's on the bond. That's an easy thing. In this example, you needed to know the annual economic return, the $5,000 the asset yields, in order to make the capitalization computation. But here is where we begin to encounter complexities when we take this conventional financial market calculation into the realm of natural capital assets, not financial assets, like the bond, the U.S. Treasury bond. First, the flow of the annual benefits of natural capital must be measured in dollars. What does that mean? All those flows of the goods and services that we listed on that slide that come from the natural capital of the Jersey Shore we have to measure that flow in dollars. Okay, that may not be so hard. That task is relatively straightforward, for example, when there is a private market where prices are determined for those goods and services. For example, for the commercially harvested fish that come from the New Jersey fisheries that are dependent on the ecological integrity of the ocean, uh, for the fish and the shellfish that are commercially harvested, those are sold in markets. They have a dollar value. There's a commercial fish market. And adjusted for the cost of the other inputs, besides the natural capital of the asset of the marine environment, there is a ready and valid measure of the annual dollar value of the output, the fish, the commercially harvested fish, generated by the natural capital asset, in this case, the ocean. The example of those market prices means that there's a measure of what economists call willingness to pay. Someone willingly paid so many dollars for those commercial fish catch, for the sea bass, for the sea trout, for the crabs, the lobsters, etc. They were sold in a market. Somebody willingly paid an amount of money for them that we can measure. Consumers place a value on that good, and that value is equal at least to the price that they paid. If the, if, the, if the consumer didn't value that good at what the price was, then the consumer wouldn't buy it. So it's a minimum value of what the consumer valued that good. That's easy. However, when no private market exists for the output of the ecosystem, the output of natural capital, then this valuation becomes more difficult. For example, What's the value of a day of surf fishing off Island Beach State Park? Or a day of bird watching at the Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge in Ocean County? If, never, if you've never been to that refuge, you should go before you leave the state. It's fantastic. Uh, or a glorious, sunny, lazy day in July with friends and family in New Jersey Beach. Let's go right now, right? Beats being in the lecture hall. And it beats the temperature out there, 56 degrees and going down. Look at that day, right? That's a neat thing, right? Beach days. How many beach days there? A lot of them. A lot of them, right? 
uh, or even more complex. What's the value of the tidal marshes of Barnegat Bay for the protection that they provide against storm surges? Or the value of pre preserving uh, biodiversity in Great Egg Harbor mar marine environment? or the value of nutrient recycling that goes on in that, in, that, in that tidal estuary. In these and other cases, there's no ready, easy, private market price like there was for the commercial fish, the commercially harvest fish. That is, there's no willingness to pay of market participants. So no market price exists for valuing the echo services provided by the natural capital assets of the shore. In such cases, economists have developed a number of methodologies to infer such values. That is to estimate the equivalent of the market price to, to derive the dollar value of the ecosystem services that arise from the natural capital. That is to get the equivalent of the measure of that $5,000 on the bond. Okay, do you see that's where we're trying to get? That what is the annual value of the flow of services coming out? It's easy to do when you have market prices, the commercial fish. It's harder to do for those things that we've just listed now. So economists have developed these four methods, and we'll talk about them in turn. Travel cost, contingent valuation, hedonic price, and avoided cost. For example, in the case of outdoor recreation, beach going, recreation fishing, boating, bird watching, water sports, economists have used several methods that attempt to infer the monetary value of the activity. One method is the travel cost method. And that is how much do beach get to the site in time and money? In other words, if you have a day at the beach, Where'd you come from? How long did it take you? And what did you, what did you pay out to get there? If I traveled from my home in Morris County to go to Cape May to have a beach day, that day must be what? At least worth to me what it cost me to get there. Otherwise what? I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. Isn't that the equivalent of the market price for fish? So that's the idea there. Another technique, and this is a very clever one, is called contingent valuation. And economists try to do this through taking surveys. And you got to do it carefully, through carefully designed surveys that ask people, how much is it worth to you? But they do it cleverly. They don't come out blatantly with that question. They do it in an inferential way. And they try, they're asked to infer the day, a value of a day's recreation based on the characteristics of the recreational site. Another technique used by economists is the hedonic price method. Hedonic price method. It attempts to infer, notice I use the word infer, because I don't have an explicit price. I don't have a market price. It attempts to infer the value of various attributes of an asset. And for example, let me give you an example. It is heavily used by economists in examining housing markets. The concept is to try to identify quantitatively the, listen to what I'm saying now, the individual effect of the many and varied characteristics of a house that determine its value or its price. In mathematical terms, those of you who know the calculus, that statement would be to say, to get the partial derivatives of a, fu of a multivariate function whose dependent variable is house price, and whose independent variables, on the right-hand side of the equation, are all the, va all the attributes of the house that determine the price. And I want to measure the partial, the separate, the individual contribution of the individual characteristics of the house. Further into it. Thus, house prices depend upon the diverse bundle of characteristics of the house. It's structured. That is, what's the size of it? Is it a new home? What's its age? What's the size of the lot? What's the type of construction? It the house price depends on the neighborhood characteristics. 
What's the median income in the neighborhood? What's the percent of owner-occupied houses in the neighborhood? How near is the home to transportation sources? Can I get to a train station? Can I get to a bus route? A big one in New Jersey, and one you're probably very familiar with if you think about it. Anybody want to try what else determines the house value? Bingo. School quality, right? It's what the teachers tell you. It's what the teachers' union tells you. The quality of the school system, you know, your parents live in the school system because they're going to try to give you the best education they can, and they're going to try and do so in New Jersey. It's not the same way in other states by having to live in the district. That's a variable, okay? And for our purposes, suppose I add to the housing characteristics nearness to the beach. That probably helped determine the house value. Not for my house in Mars County, if that makes sense, but for those houses in the shore communities, proximity to the natural capital. Remember what I was trying to do, get the partial derivatives in regular language to get the individual contribution of each of those characteristics, if they're statistically significant, to the dependent variable, the house price. Okay, and economists have statistical techniques that do that. They have techniques that estimate these individual independent effects on home prices of each of the many possible characteristics that affect home values, including the proximity or presence of natural capital to the home. And we'll look at that with a particular study. Another methodology, and think through this one with me, attempts to measure the annual economic value of those echo services provided by New Jersey's natural capital as storm their value for the waste that they assimilate and for the nutrients that they receive that you may have studied in this course or, or you would in other aspects of the, of the sea, ocean, land. This avoided cost valuation method would attempt to estimate the property damage avoided. That is the damages from storm, the damages avoided because of the storm buffering effects of that interface, that natural interface, or the costs of having to provide water treatment facilities that would have to be provided in lieu of the waste and nutrient assimilative and recycling services provided now by the natural processes. Let's look at several examples of these techniques as applied to the New Jersey Shore. What's this slide show? It shows you estimates of the annual number of beach visit days that occur in different states in a year. And the source is at the bottom of the slide. You can't see it, but again, it's on the Sakai site. Note the large number. There's New Jersey. Number of participants is the second column. How many people visit the beach? Three point, almost four million. And how many days over the course of a year do they visit the beach? Add them all up, you get almost 41 million beach days. You going the beach to the New Jersey Shore one day is one of that 40.881 million days, okay? One person day visit is one day of the 41 million days. That's a huge number, right? It's a big number. I was stunned by that number. And, and uh, it's interesting, I thought. Uh, we rank fourth. Only New Florida, California, and forget Hawaii. I mean, that's not fair. Uh, you know, because you go to beach year-round there, right? Uh, have more beach days in New Jersey. We have a lot of coast. A lot of coast relative to other states for the beach, obviously. You know, Iowa's not here. Uh, but that's a, that's a big number. We rank fourth. So. Um, I guess it's not really surprising when you consider, you know, that 40 million. There's the New Jersey beach, you know, how many people are on those 127 miles of ocean beaches in New Jersey on a hot weekend summer's day. Um, that 40 million number is pretty impressive. So if we know the number of days annually on the beach by visitors, if we could get a value per day, we could multiply the two and get the total value in money of those beach days. 
on the New Jersey beaches, the total value of the beach visits provided by a clean beach, an accessible beach, and a clean ocean, and an interface that is benign, that is not inundated by sea level rise, where we have barrier beaches. I have to ask Ken, what happens if we had significant sea level rise? Would we have barrier beaches? Would they just move inland? I don't know. We can ask Ken that. That's a good question. OK. So let's use some estimates. Um, there's two estimates, two methods that we talked about, travel cost and contingent valuation. Two different studies, and the reference there in the footnotes. Again, you can look at the links. One is from a travel cost study, and that came up with a, that was a study of island beach visits, visits to island beach by that travel cost method. Came up with a study of $31 a day and a much lower value by a contingent valuation study, a survey method, came up with a number about five bucks a day. So suppose we take that range, five to 31. Five dollars, the beach day's visit per person, five dollars a day, could be as high as $31 a day. That's a, that's a pretty good range. It's a factor, what, six between the lowest, low and the high. There's the second column is the 40 million days, a little bit more, almost 41 million days. Multiply the first and the second column, and you get an estimate of the annual value, value in millions of dollars of those beach recreation days. Those benefits, that value, accrues to the beachgoers, you and me, the value of us going to the beach in the aggregate. It is the value of a day at the beach, at the New Jersey beach. Those who use the beach for recreation receive, economists would say, in monetary terms, a recreation day of this amount, $5 and $31 per day. And in the aggregate, in the aggregate, very, very large number, right? That number ranges from $219 million at the bottom to $1.2 billion at the higher estimate. That's the annual value of the services, the beach recreation services provided by the natural capital assets of New Jersey Shore, stringing together all the concepts that we've developed thus far. And that's just beach visits, not all these other things that we've also listed as other possible benefits. Here's another estimate of the natural capital at the New Jersey shore. This one using, uh, let me go back, did I? Right, okay. Let, one step before I do the, ne the next estimate, I'm, I, I just wanna come back to the next step. Let's take the numbers one step further. This slide is an extension of the previous slide, except the first column now is the third column of the last slide. It was total value. We want to now capitalize these annual value estimates to obtain an estimate of the value of the natural capital asset that is ultimately responsible for the annual flows. That is the value of the natural assets of the clean ocean and the ocean beach interface without which those beach visits, all 40 million of them, 41 million of them, would not occur, or at least a lot of the 41 million of them would not occur. Using an interest rate of 5%, our same interest rate that we used before to capitalize the $5,000 flow, remember what we did there? That $5,000 flow is now the 219 million flow or the 1.2 billion flow. We have two estimates for it, a high and a low. Take that 5% and divide it into it, into the flows. So we're using an interest rate, or as an economist call it, a discount rate of 5%. And there's some very complex financial theory that determines that number, why it's five and not seven and not three, because that makes a big difference. The value of the natural capital of the clean water and the clean beach assets of New Jersey is somewhere between 4.3 billion and 25.7 billion. That's the equivalent number to the 100,000 that we valued the financial asset. 
what is the value what is the value of an asset worth that is generating 1.2 billion dollars in annual economic value at 5% that value is 25.7 billion dollars that's the question that we've just answered asked and answered here's another estimate of the natural capital of the New Jersey Shore. And this one using that hedonic price method. This one identifies the determinants of house values in two New Jersey Shore communities. You may know them, Stone Harbor and Avalon in Cape May County in the southern part of the state. Very, very nice shore communities. Very, very, very nice shore communities. It examines 249 home sales that occurred in those two communities between January 2002 and 2003. So the, the economists had the house prices for the, house, the, the sales of the homes that sold over that period of time, 249 sales. For each of those sales, data were available on the sales price, the characteristics of the home, the lot size, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, et cetera, the age of the home. And then they were able to construct, because they knew the address, a variable indicating the location of the property with respect to its proximity to the beach or the bay, right? You're on the barrier island, you're either near the beach, you're near the bay, or somewhere in between. The technique uses regression analysis, which parses out quantitatively, as we've talked about, these various influences on house prices. The results indicate, and that's the equation that was estimated, house price is a function of house features, age, beachfront, or not. Okay, that would be the, the equation that was estimated and the individual coefficients, the partial derivatives, the estimates of the partial derivatives were estimated by the regression analysis. And the results indicate, listen carefully, that a beachfront home sold, as the economists would say it, for a, twice as much, a 206% premium compared to the very same home located away from the beach. Take the same house, same size, same age, same number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, same characteristics, and move it off the beach, and the price was 206% lower. Or the price of that same house inland or off the beach was 206% higher if you could move it to the beachfront. From that information, you could calculate the additional value of all beachfront property in these two towns to get, for the owners, the dollar value of the asset to them of being owning a home on the beach. This is the premium in home value that accrues, in this case, to the private owners of the property. Now, let's conclude with summarizing what we've done and, and its implications. Let's move to the uses of such estimates as I've described to you and as I've given you examples as the final third part of our discussion, and this is relatively brief. An intuitive, basic result of placing of what we've just done, that is to place a dollar value on the natural capital of the New Jersey shore, is to give specificity to the concept that the beaches, the ocean, the bays, the wetlands, the estuaries are valuable, economically valuable, in and of themselves in an undegraded natural state. The estimates also conf confirm and affirm that these natural assets provide economically valuable outputs, both goods and services, and that the value of these outputs can be measured and expressed in monetary terms, that is, in dollars. Thus, estimating the value of such outputs enables us to make a valid and on equal terms comparison to between conventional economic development of the New Jersey shore and the preservation of the water and land resources in their natural undiminished state. Heretofore, traditional economic development, more houses, more roads, more development, uh, with its obvious outcomes of benefits expressed in jobs, GDP, output, income, often dominated land use and natural resource use decisions because there was an absence of information on the other side of what is potentially being lost or given up 
that is the ecosystem benefits that would be eliminated or damaged or diminished by the economic development. A comparison between the benefits of development versus the benefits of maintaining the environmental integrity of the natural asset the key information required in order to make efficient social decisions, public decisions, on how to choose to use scarce resources. Valuing the flow of goods and services of natural assets can also inform public decisions with respect to the acquisition of natural assets so that given finite public funds, the natural assets with the most value are acquired first. That's the same answer to the question, the conventional question, what do I invest in? Invest in the asset whose return is highest. We can now begin to answer that question from an ecological perspective. Such es estimates can also inform the planning process for promoting sustainable economic development. That is avoiding development where large ecosystem values are lost or where large ecosystem damages occur. And the natural capital assets would be significantly diminished or depreciated. And finally, and with unfortunately some immediate relevance and application, natural resource benefit estimates, which are simultaneously damage estimates. If I estimate benefits, I've estimated damages. The damages would be the benefits that would be lost if the resource is damaged. These estimates, such as the ones I've discussed here with you and others like them in the large literature that exists have been used in litigation by very, very clever lawyers, and that's a whole other career to consider, using these estimates in litigation, either on both sides of the litigation, you know, uh, to determine compensation for damages to natural resources from various toxic releases. The Comprehensive Environmental Responses Compensation and Liability Act something you may know from media accounts as Superfund, federal legislation, established liability protocols. Who's responsible? Who's liable for damages to natural assets? Who's liable to damages for natural assets from the discharge of hazardous substances into the environment? The act was invoked in the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska many years ago now. And both the concept of natural capital and many of the techniques that I've described today with you to estimate the value of the service flows, the economic value of the service flows, were used to determine environmental damages and hence the liability of ExxonMobil to compensate those damaged, the victims. We are certain to see multiple applications of those very same techniques under the Superfund uh, law in the aftermath of the horrific environmental cost imposed by last summer's oil spill of British, by British Petroleum, the Deep Horizon Well in the Gulf of Mexico. We will see a reprise of all that litigation as individuals sue under that act for compensation for damages and measure damages by these methods. Of direct relevance to your course, these estimates and other like them can be used to determine what would be lost if sea level changes diminish or eliminate the opportunity for beach recreation, for example, and many of the other substantial ec environmental economic goods and services now provided by the natural capital of the shore. I hope our discussion today has given you a new dimension of how to think about the New Jersey shore and the threat of climate change to the state's natural environment. We have a few minutes. I'd be pleased to respond to answer any questions or to hear your perspective on what do you think about this. So take a couple minutes and then break and go. But there it is. Thank you for being attentive and courteous to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Comments, questions? Hogwash to it all? <laughs> that could be included, sure. It's part of the day's experience. That what you would think of that $31, right? The gas, the oil, the distance, the time. I 
how much a charge you get in, the ice, the soda? Good question. Anything else? Comment? Different from what came before in the course, right? Different. Think about the economics and the social science and the interface with policy. Lots of good career opportunities for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Best wishes to you all. <laughs>